So welcome to today's session, um, Preventing Cancer, Genetics, Lifestyle, and the Environment. I am Dana Dornsife, President and Founder of Lazarex Cancer Foundation. We're um, a patient advocacy organization located in Danville, California. This month, we have the pleasure of celebrating our 10th year of supporting patients in their um, quest to stay engaged in their battle with cancer. We help them navigate through their clinical trial options. And then if a patient is accepted into a trial and needs financial assistance to cover the ancillary cost associated with their participation in a trial, we provide that assistance to them and we also provide financial assistance for a travel companion. And by doing what we do, we eliminate uh, three of the primary barriers to cancer clinical trial participation. Um, knowledge uh, for patients about clinical trials, financial constraints um, from uh, fighting a disease um, that really causes a high degree of financial toxicity. And then finally, if you are an advanced stage patient and you're seeking participation in a clinical trial, you may not um, want to leave your support structure, your family and your friends at a time when you need them the most. And so we um, help patients take part of that support structure with them. Um, so we are proud of our association with UCSF. Um, our third patient uh, 10 years ago was sent here to UCSF and the number of patients that we've supported here um, at this institution has, has grown um, exponentially over the past 10 years and we're well over 100 patients now that we've supported here at UCSF. We're also embarking on a nationwide program um, with UCSF called IMPACT and that stands for Improving Patient Access to Cancer Clinical Trials, which obviously is um, right in alignment with um, some of the topics of today's discussion. At this point, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Robert Hyatt up to the podium. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm excited to be here to tell you about uh, SFCAN. Um, you heard a little bit about it and you saw the video. I'll tell you a little bit about the backstory and, and what we're, we're doing uh, with, with this uh, initiative. You may know it, but uh, I want to emphasize that in the city of San Francisco, cancer uh, kills more people than anything else. It's the number one cause of death in San Francisco. Um, and the exciting thing about it from our standpoint, uh, those of us that work in prevention, is that uh, if we just put into practice what we already know, and did it effectively, uh, we could prevent almost half of these cancers, make a huge impact. Um, and this is not news in the sense that uh, it's, it's uh, not been in the literature, but no one has ever tried to do it in a defined area with a collaborative effort of multiple different institutions in one place. So San Francisco Cancer Initiative, or SFCAN as we're calling it, is a citywide collaboration to reduce the cancer burden in the whole city. Uh, it's a partnership between the Department of Public Health, uh, Thomas Aragon, and his colleagues, other healthcare systems like Sutter and Kaiser and Dignity Health, community groups, and not-for-profit organizations. This in itself is a novel approach, something very difficult to do, something that we think is worthwhile uh, over a longer period of time. So as Alan Ashworth has said, San Francisco's size, its population, and its history of social justice make it an ideal place for an effort like this. It's bounded by clear, bound, uh, clear borders, water, <laughs> and, a, and a southern, uh, southern uh, uh, limit. It's uh, only 860,000 people, uh, not a huge uh, undertaking. And we know a lot about San Francisco. We know um, the characteristics of the people and the characteristics of cancer in the area. So SFCAN was an initiative to try to tackle this. And we now have a, a website. You can just uh, you know, Google SFCAN or sfcancer.org and find out a lot more about it. But what I want to tell you about now, just a couple slides, is the elements behind it. So what we did first was document the cancer burden in terms of incidents, which are new cases 
uh, mortality, which are deaths, trends, which are directions that cancer uh, is going up or down, uh, disparities, meaning differences between different subpopulations, and costs. So we can do that with data that we collect from cancer registries and surveys, and uh, it's, it's quite detailed, and we know quite a bit about the population as a whole of San Francisco. Um, then what we did was um, um, use what are called geospatial technologies, things where we uh, know where people live who have cancer and then what are the characteristics of those areas. So we can describe cancer in the city and county of San Francisco by neighborhoods, by supervisory districts, by zip code, uh, and try to localize where, where we see the problems. We then identified a, a lot of the investigators uh, at UCSF and other uh, institutions who've worked in San Francisco, and we came up with about 30 or 40 individuals who've done something within the city that's relevant to reducing the cancer burden. So we had a team. Um, and uh, then we uh, followed a, a concept called collective impact, which actually is something that's come out of the Stanford Business School that says for big, complex, uh, wicked problems, you can't uh, rely on any one institution to solve them. You need to have a, a collective uh, effort to make it happen with some sort of backbone uh, effort. And so UCSF is providing the backbone, but we're pulling together all the expertise in the city to make it happen. Uh, so what we've done is uh, um, introduce these uh, innovative ideas about how to really prevent cancer for these most common cancers and to make a measurable dis dis difference. We need to have ways of assessing our um, our progress over time. So we have uh, uh, models which show us what we can expect to do in every year over a longer period of time, maybe 10, 15 years that we'll be dedicated to this. Um, and uh, in the process, we're gonna identify other areas for research. Some of the data that we've collected look something like this. So if you look at the Hispanic, Asian American, uh, African American and white populations in the city, you can see that the numbers of new cases are primarily in the Asian and white population because that's who most of the people are in the city. But then you can break it up by the different cancers and show which ones are the most common in each one of these uh, subpopulations. And then we can also collect data that looks at rates or trends in rates over time. So this is the, an example for prostate cancer. And you can see by uh, looking at the time since the early 1990s to the present that there's been a, a diminution in the uh, new cases and mortality from prostate cancer. But you see what we call disparities. So that the top line are African Americans. And the difference between both the new cases and the mortality from prostate cancer among African Americans is substantial and worrisome. And we don't know really whether that's due to uh, a lack of access or quality of care or something else. So this is the charge that we've given ourselves is to understand these trends, disparities, the overall burden, and to do something about it in a collective way. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? So my name is Tomas Aragon. I'm the health officer of San Francisco. Every county in California has a physician health officer who focuses on implementing legal authority for the county. You can think of, a, you can think of my role as being the combined role of the Surgeon General and the CDC Director for the, the County of San Francisco. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a, a public health 101, just give you an overview of how we look at problems because it really connects to everything that we're talking about here today. So, most of us, when we think about health, we usually think about health care. And that's really on the right side of the diagram over there. So if you see on the right side of the diagram, it says mortality, then disease and injury, and then risk behaviors. So that's what most people think of. What I want to do briefly, just review a couple of definitions that we, we work from. Um, health, this is from the World uh, Health Organization. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So health is more than the absence of disease. Public health is what we as a society do collectively to ensure the conditions in which people can be healthy. 
okay? And then population health is a systems, this is a systems framework for studying and improving the health of populations through collective action and learning. And so what I want you to think now is to, is to realize that health is produced and can be protected in the community, including all the factors that contribute to cancer. And so as you move from right to left, you see their living conditions, institu institutional inequalities, and social inequalities. So this is the big picture view. And in, he in health, including at UCSF, and in schools of public health, we look at the big picture. We want to influence everything. And the other thing I want you to think about is that think about, think about all of this having really deep, deep roots. And those roots represents our belief systems and our culture. And a lot of it is unseen. And this is one of the reasons why it's hard to transform communities, because we have to figure out how do we transform people's belief systems and mental models so that we can we can make we can make progress. And this is one of the challenges we. This is one we. I was just talking right before I came up about how we've become more polarized and it's difficult to come together. But we can come together when we have a common cause, and that's really the theme of why we're here today. So as we move to the left, which we call moving upstream, moving upstream, we want to impact really social conditions, social policy. When we can change laws, we impact health for many generations into the future. When you think of the impact that tobacco uh, laws to uh, minimize exposure to secondhand smoke, think of all the health that has been protected. Think of all the diseases and cancers that have been prevented. It is the most effective cheapest way for us to have impact. This is the example um, of this Tuesday that uh, Supervisor Malia Cohen introducing legislation to ban menthol and flavored cigarette and tobacco products for San Francisco because they target youth, okay? The industry, the industry wants, us to, wants to get us addicted and our youth addicted, and so this is really important legislation. And the great thing about this is that, as I mentioned, most cost-effective way, huge impact, and your voice makes a big difference because your legislators listen to you. So in public health, when we say we need your help and you, and you, and you pick up the phone or send an email, big impact. Big impact, and right there you'll see here. Um, uh, it's hard; it may be hard to read, but influencing policy and legislation, mobilizing neighborhoods and communities, fostering coalitions and networks, changing organizational practices, educating providers, promoting community education, and strengthening strengthening individual knowledge and skills. And actually, what you'll see there in the picture, you'll see Dr. Uh, Bob Hyatt. We had uh, Dr. Stan Glantz from uh, all from UCSF and Dollar uh, Valerie Yerger were also there and this could not have happened without UC San Francisco. UC San Francisco has been a phenomenal partner because they provide they have provided us the scientific basis for us to really make a difference. And so we've been very fortunate and grateful with our partnerships over the years and I'm really excited that we're actually moving in in this very collective way to use San Francisco as a laboratory to figure out what works because what we do here in San Francisco will really spread around the world. So that's what, what I want to say. Thank you so much for your time. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Blanco, and I'm a genetic counselor. Many of you might say, well, what's that? Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to try and explain some of what we do um, and what I do through a couple of slides and through um, our presentation today. How many people in the room are familiar with that woman? <laughs> Great, almost everyone. Um, Angelina Jolie has an inherited alteration, what we call a mutation, in a gene called BRCA1, and it dramatically increased her risk to develop breast cancer and ovarian cancer. She watched both her mother and her aunt die from these diseases, and she was very public about her decision to undergo genetic testing and take preventative measures to protect herself from cancer. So BRCA1 and 2 are common genes in the population. We estimate that 
maybe one person and about four to 500 will carry a mutation in these genes. And there are many other different genes that when they are inherited from a mother or a father, increases the risk for cancer. It's not just breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Colon cancer can be inherited, as well as some of the less common cancers, thyroid cancer and others. So what do we do in terms of genetic testing? How, how do we figure out that, that somebody is at risk for an inherited alteration? And why does that make a difference? Well, it makes a difference because as women, for example, we have about a 13% lifetime risk for breast cancer. But if you carry a mutation in one of these genes, for example, your lifetime risk for breast cancer is more like up to 85%. So that's a huge difference in risk. And by identifying individuals that are up here with the extremely high risk and intervening in that population, we have the biggest bang for our buck in terms of prevention. If we can prevent those cancers in the extremely high risk population, we're going to have a tremendous impact. So when we do genetic testing, we typically get one of three test results. And some people say there's a third, right? Isn't there just positive and negative? A positive means we've identified an alteration in a gene that increases the risk for cancer. Negative is pretty straightforward as well. We haven't found any spelling differences in somebody's genes that would indicate an increased risk for cancer. But there's unfortunately this middle category called a variant of unknown significance. And that middle category is where we identified a difference, but we don't have enough information to determine if that difference causes disease or not. Does it increase the risk for cancer, or does it just represent a normal difference between me and you that has no relationship to health at all? Um, so that category is a problem in San Francisco because we are a diverse population. And the way that we categorize something as a positive test result is directly related to what we know about genetics. And what we know about genetics, by and large, comes from the study of Caucasians. And so in San Francisco and other places around the world, but in particular in San Francisco, where we have such a high population of Asians, we also have a very robust Hispanic and African American population, it's a problem if you're comparing their genes to Caucasians. That, that doesn't work right, doesn't work right. So this is a problem because we wanna intervene. If we can't categorize somebody's genetics as being normal or abnormal, abnormal meaning identifying something that increases the risk for cancer, what do we do? How do we make a decision to intervene or not intervene with what we don't know? So what we are doing is really trying to reach these communities through partnership with San Francisco General Hospital, or Zuckerberg San Francisco General, excuse me, and um, we have genetic counselors on staff there to try and identify these minority patients, make sure that they don't slip through the cracks, get them the genetic testing that they need, and in time, those efforts will allow us to better interpret the test results for minorities. The more people we test from multiple ethnic backgrounds, the more we will really begin to understand the normal variation among people and therefore the specific alterations in all populations that can lead to inherited cancer risk. And this is so important because we want to move people out of that center category into negative or positive because if they're positive, we're going to take action. We're going to recommend, if we use Angelina Jolie as, as an example, we're going to recommend things like mastectomy to reduce breast cancer risk, oophorectomy to reduce ovarian cancer risk. But this is also a disease that impacts men. Men have an increased risk for prostate cancer. There's an increased risk for melanoma in men and women, as well as pancreatic cancer in men and women. So this is a disease that we can make an impact on as long as we know who really needs the care. So that's it for me today. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to any questions. Um, 
Well, thank you very much for your attention. I'm Michelle Malisco. I'm a breast medical oncologist at UCSF. And um, I don't think I've ever been asked to talk for just five minutes, so I'm going to do my best to stay on time. I have to say, I've, the, the people in front of me have been doing such a good job, so um, I want to stay in, in line with that. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, so far the people that have spoken have, t have definitely approached this from a sort of more of a broad health perspective, so I apologize if I tend to have a sort of breast cancer-centric flavor, but that's what I know the most about. So um, I will try to refrain from always being focused on breast cancer. Um, so when we heard Alan Ashworth speak earlier about the initiatives in SFCAN, the ones that stood out um, large, looming large, were the reduction in smoking and also um, the awareness of hepatitis B and, and now also hepatitis C and the risk for hepatomas um, in the Asian community and other communities. But um, I want to talk about an extremely common problem, uh, not as big of a problem in, in San Francisco as many, many communities, um, but obesity. Obesity um, related burden of cancer represents up to 9% of the cancer burden among women in North America, Europe, and the Middle East. And this is a slide that demonstrates the results of a working group that's part of the World Health Organization that has shown that there is strong, compelling evidence that being overweight or obese increases the risk of at least 13 types of cancer. And I've labeled these in the order, um, this relative risk or odds ratio says, what is your chance of developing this cancer as compared to a normal uh, weight individual? And so uterine cancer, it is remarkable. If you are overweight or if you are obese and have a, what they considered in this study the highest body mass index, which was over 40, you had over a seven times greater chance of developing uterine cancer than a normal weight person. And these, these going down the line, you can see that there's also increased risk of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, renal cell um, kidney cancer, liver cancer, pancreas, multiple myeloma, colon cancer, and then postmenopausal breast cancer. Now these few on the bottom, the 1.1 relative risk doesn't seem very impressive, but given that breast cancer is one of the most common cancers, as well as colon cancer being a very common cancer, the impact of being overweight and obese and increasing the risk of these cancers across the United States and across the world is dramatic. Focusing specifically on breast cancer, there was recently a study that was done and published in, in JAMA Oncology, and Carla Kurlikowski, one of our colleagues at UCSF, participated in this as part of the San Francisco Mammography Registry that looked at things that impact common you know, risk factors, both lifestyle as well as hereditary factors that impact the chances of developing breast cancer. And this is broken into both postmenopausal and premenopausal women. And you can see here that body mass index has a dramatic impact. The lighter, lighter peach color is postmenopausal breast cancer. And so we can see that almost a quarter of the population attributable risk of breast cancer is due to being overweight or obese. This is only morphed by or, or daunted by breast, dense breast, which is another topic that we're trying to address at UCSF. Um, by trying to identify the best way of screening women who have dense breasts. And um, you know, we certainly appreciate our genetic counselors um, who talk about, oh, I have extra minutes if I need, well, wonderful. <laughs> she's like, I just can't, she's not gonna shut up, so I'm gonna just let her have it. Um, so you can see here that you know, family history of breast cancer is important for both, uh, you know, for both premenopausal and postmenopausal breast cancers, but obesity is a dramatic, dramatic factor in terms of developing postmenopausal breast cancer. And so going a little bit deeper into the work that's been done by Carla Kurlikowski and um, the, the group that I just presented, they looked at the differences in the types of breast cancer that, are develop, that develop in overweight or obese women. And these numbers you can see here circled in red reflect that being overweight or obese actually increases your risk of developing estrogen receptor negative breast cancer, which is more difficult to treat and, and generally thought to be more, more deadly. So this might be a little bit confusing because we think that if someone's overweight or obese, we think they have more circulating estrogens and therefore they're more likely to develop an ER positive breast cancer. But in fact, this study, this very, very large study found that being overweight or obese is a greater risk factor for ER negative breast cancer 
And of course, we don't have prevention strategies for ER negative breast cancer as we do for ER positive breast cancer. So our prevention strategy is to reduce your weight. So how does this happen? Well, there are many, many postulated biological mechanisms underlying the association of obesity and cancer outcomes and also cancer development. And um, this is your only science slide you're gonna see, I bet, during this talk. If you'd gone to the other, I encourage some of the folks I know in the room to go and you know, check out the big data or check out the you know, immunotherapy sessions. And so you'd be seeing all these sort of slides with all these pathways. And this is the only one you're gonna see, but the reality is, is that fat is not inert. It actually has remarkable impacts on, on the body. It results in this, you know, the metabolically active um, adipose tissue results in altered systemic physiology. You end up with alterations in levels of insulin, insulin-like growth factor, leptins, adiponectin, inflammatory markers. And all of these factors have a direct influence on cancer cells as well as an indirect effect on the tumor environment. And so in addition to the fact that being overweight or obese increases your risk of developing many different types of cancers, it also impacts your body's ability to be able to treat those cancers as well. And so just to finish up, because I am going to try to stay on time, I want to talk briefly about some of the initiatives. And again, I, I don't intend to be breast cancer centric, but these are this is what I do. And we have a number of um, initiatives going on um, at UCSF that I'm quite proud of. Um, the first being the WISDOM trial. This is a very large study that was um, uh, conceived of and um, ultimately was funded by um, funded by the uh, P. Corey, but uh, the leader of this is Laura Esserman. And the goal is to enroll 100,000 women across the Athena Breast Health Network. And that consists of the five UC schools, as well as a group of um, hospitals in North Dakota, believe it or not, the Stanford Health System. And the goal is to try to personalize breast cancer screening. So for those of you um, who are of the age to decide when they should actually start getting breast cancer screening, or if you have um, daughters, relatives, cousins who want, are confused by all these recommendations about whether they should start at age 40, start at age 50, um, wisdom is going to help us. The goal is to enroll women who are between the ages of 40 and 75 and take into account a number of factors including their family history, their breast density, and, be, and then a, a limited genetic panel um, being done by a company called Color, a collaborator called Color, and be able to stratify people into a level of risk. Mm -hmm. And those women will be then randomized. Women are randomized to a sort of standard um, follow the guidelines screening or into a, a more personalized breast cancer screening. So an example of that might be someone who has no family history of breast cancer, low breast density, and no genetic uh, mutations, they might be able to get away with having a mammogram at age 45 and then not need another one until age 50 <coughs> and then have mammograms every three years. And then on contrast, someone who has very high breast density, and you remember from the previous slide how much breast density actually impacts um, the risk of developing breast cancer, um, a person with very high breast density or a family history of breast cancer or a mutation that's uncovered, they would be referred to um, uh, Amy, Amy's group and would have discussions about risk, redux risk reduction, potentially the use of a drug like tamoxifen, which can reduce breast density and also can reduce the risk of developing an ER positive breast cancer. But my hope and dream is that those patients will um, actually be able to get access to more opportunities to help reduce their weight and increase physical activity. Which leads me to the, le the next um, study that we have going on. And this kind of shifts away from uh, prevention of breast cancer, but what we are trying to do, once patients have um, been diagnosed with breast cancer, we have a study at UCSF um, that, that I'm leading looking at giving women who are going through chemotherapy Fitbits to try to promote um, you know, health and wellness, try to monitor their sleep and their activity levels to try to see many women gain weight after treatment for breast cancer. Many women become less active after treatment for breast cancer. And the idea about intervening early uh, to try to see if we can keep people active and prevent that weight gain, we're hoping that we can, uh, certainly hoping that we can improve quality of life, but also improve breast cancer outcomes. 
And then the last study, which we're just getting started on getting open, is a study called Be Well, which is being led by Jennifer Ligabel at Dana-Farber. And we are going to be uh, participating in as part of the Alliance Cooperative Group. And this is a very large, um, intending to enroll close to 5,000 women diagnosed with breast cancer who've completed their acute phase of treatment to um, engage them in a two-year-long weight loss program. And it's a very intensive program involving um, calls from nurses weekly, um, a strict diet and calorie reduction mechanism of trying to reduce people's body mass index to below 27. Um, and this is you know, very exciting. Um, one of the things I have to comment about is both the Fitbit study and the Be Well study are essentially being funded at UCSF by philanthropy. Um, the Be Well study is part of a cooperative group, and what that means is that we get very, very little money to, detu to conduct these kind of trials. Um, and the Fitbit study, as I said, was also funded by philanthropy. So even though we recognize how massive a problem overweight and obese obesity is in terms of the risk of breast cancer, risk of developing all kinds of cancers, and the impact that we can have on improving outcomes in cancer by treating overweight and obesity, um, the, the funding mechanisms, the government funding mechanisms, don't find it quite as sexy as, as funding a new drug. Um, and so I always tell my patients, and I know some of um, them are in the audience, as that, um, you know, you're going to get a nag from me every time you leave asking how many times did you go out and exercise this week. And, and it's something that we can definitely do to have dramatic impacts on cancer outcomes. And so I'm going to stop there. What if checking Facebook could prevent you from getting cancer? It's possible. I'm Eleni Linos, and I'm not your typical dermatologist. I have a PhD in epidemiology, and for over a decade, I've worked on cancer prevention. And not just any cancer. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the cancer that's more common than all other cancers combined, and that's skin cancer. So there are over 5 million new cases of skin cancer diagnosed each year in the US alone, over 10,000 melanomas. And with skin cancer, we have the potential for preventable cancers. Indoor tanning or tanning beds are a major carcinogen and actually account for half a million new cancers each year. That's half a million preventable cancers each year. So although the numbers are astounding, our prevention messages seem to be failing because over half of college students are still using a tanning bed, and over 20% of adolescents and teens are using tanning beds. Using a tanning bed in early life, so under the age of 35, doubles your risk of melanoma. So what are we doing wrong? In part, I think we're not really reaching the right people, those at risk, young women, with the right messages at the right time. And that's where social media comes in. And today I want to tell you how the same strategies that online marketers use to convince us to buy a pair of shoes or a new piece of jewelry or a new car can be used to help us all live healthier lives. So, the example of indoor tanning and melanoma is the one that I've been studying, but this concept can be applied to other cancers as well. For tanning beds specifically, using Twitter data, we found that conversations about tanning beds on Twitter are common. There's one tweet every eight seconds, but they rarely mention harms, and that's a problem. So what we did was we designed public health prevention messages, and using Google Ads targeted them to people's screens just when they were searching for tanning salons. And these messages were viewed hundreds of thousands of times and people clicked on them, so we know we can get a targeted prevention message to the target audience. But the real question is, do these messages work to shift actual behaviors? And so I want to tell you a little bit about our preliminary work on that. So what we did to try and understand what messages would be most effective for this audience was we started by talking to young women who tan. We conducted detailed focus groups and interviews using rigorous qualitative methods, and our findings were fascinating. 
So first of all, we found that this generation of young adults is invincible. They're never going to get cancer, or so they feel. They also are really independent. They want facts. They want truth. And they don't trust authority. In fact, they don't trust messages coming from the American Cancer Society, or from the CDC, or from UCSF. Um, as an organization, they don't want to hear what to do or what not to do from big organizations. But the people they trust are their peers. They trust their friends. They trust Instagram celebrities. They trust YouTube celebrities their own age. And they're likely to do what a peer or friend tells them to do. They're also a generation that has an attention span of less than 60 seconds. In fact, <laughs> They usually only watch the first three seconds of any video, so your message really has to be there. But they really are united um, in wanting to know the truth and not wanting to be played or used by big corporations. So they're, they're very thoughtful. So using the principles of what, uh, what we learned and using the rigorous qualitative analysis, what we decided to do was to partner with the, uh, the people that could convince these women to stop using tanning beds. And so our partners are not your typical cancer prevention partners. I'll tell you about our partner, ZDog MD, is uh, a rapper, physician, parody songwriter with over half a million followers who um, has made an incredible parody song uh, to convince young women to stop using tanning beds. Um, Alexa and Lauren are um, both Instagram celebrities. Between their Instagram and YouTube followers, together they have over two million. They can reach over two million young women, and they talk about beauty and respecting your body and being confident in who you are. And they've agreed to partner with us too. So what I really want to tell you about today is what we're going to do with these videos, because that's the most exciting part for me as a researcher. We're launching a large-scale online randomized controlled trial using Facebook and Instagram ads that will collectively reach over a million people. And what we're going to be able to do is rigorously test whether or not these videos work to shift behaviors. So we're going to have an intervention group that will see these videos and a control group that won't. And we're going to pull both. We're going to survey them and ask them, do you remember seeing the video? Do you know that tanning beds cause cancer or wrinkles or are bad for you? And the third question we're going to ask is, are you planning to use a tanning bed in the next month? And that question is key because it's validated and it's shown to predict actual tanning behaviors. And in fact, it's exactly the same question Coca-Cola uses when they try to figure out if their ads work. So they, it's purchase intent in that case. In our case, it's behavior intent. And so we'll be able to know on a massive scale and nationally whether or not these targeted, tailored approaches to cancer prevention work. And I would argue that if we can show that this one example works, tanning beds and melanoma, then the principle could be applied to any other cancer where behaviors play a role. We could apply this idea to tobacco cessation. We could apply it to obesity prevention. We could even apply it for targeted genetic screening for those at high risk. We could even go beyond cancer prevention and apply it to any disease where behaviors play a role. So I think this could be a game changer for prevention. And I'd love to talk to you more about it in the question section. Okay, well, um, I would just like to say thank you to all of our panelists. This is all uh, very fascinating, cutting edge stuff, and I think we should um, feel um, just grateful and privileged that we can all be here today to participate um, in their expertise and sharing of knowledge. Um, I do want to say this is the easiest panel I've ever moderated. We are three minutes early. <laughs> <laughs>
And um, so I would like to begin the, the Q&A session. So if any of you do have questions, if you'd like to pass them down now, um, uh, what I'd like to suggest is I will read the questions and then I'll just step away from the mic and the appropriate panelist can, can come up and, and answer uh, the question. So um, thank you. Regarding genetic testing, uh, making the assumption that people will be receptive uh, to being genetically tested. The reality is the fear factor is huge. Fear that you will test positive, fear that you may be irresponsible for passing along the gene. Uh, how do you word or f phrase or deal with this? That's a fantastic question. Um, not everybody comes to genetic testing in the same way. Um, some patients come to us because they've already had a diagnosis of cancer and it might make a difference in their treatment. Um, but we also see a large number of individuals who don't have cancer yet, and that's really our opportunity for prevention, right? Identifying individuals who are at very high risk who don't have cancer. Um, it's, I'm not gonna lie, it's hard. It's a challenge to know that you are living with an increased risk to develop cancer. And sometimes the interventions seem extreme. <clears throat> removing breast tissue, removing ovarian tissue. You know, some, some people feel that this is extreme. Um, but every person will come to it based on their own personal experiences. Did they uh, grow up watching family members die from cancer and is that something that scared them? Or is it something that motivated them? In some people, it's motivated them to seek out answers and seek out a genetic explanation. And in other individuals, it just causes too much fear and they choose not to step forward for genetic testing. There's no right or wrong answer, but I do believe that with adequate long-term care, and we have a clinic at UCSF whose sole function is to follow men and women for the lifetime who are at increased risk to help people to adjust, to help them get the word out to their family members, to help get their children tested when they get old enough, et cetera. So we're trying to support everybody as best we can when we do identify an inherited mutation, but it's a challenge. Okay, next question. Are there studies that show that racial and cultural norms or cultural views of cancer affect access and treatment of cancer in the, those groups? And if so, will SF CAN work on this problem? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we know quite a bit about how, how different uh, subpopulations uh, uh, respond to the threat of cancer based on cultural beliefs or norms within their communities. So that's part of what we call precision population health. You've heard a lot about precision medicine. So the messages and the actions that we take uh, in communities are directed to what we know works in terms of messaging for different subpopulations. Very important uh, way to deal with, uh, with disparities. And I think the other part of the question was, um, are these differences uh, due to um, No, I'll stop there for that answer, because you know, it's, it's very important to understand the, the different uh, race, ethnic, cultural, social, uh, background to cancer, and that's that's what we do in this type of research. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, so this question is for Dr. Linos. Has any association been found between spray tan and cancer? Spray tanning, um, for those that don't know, are, is essentially a paint you can spray onto your skin and uh, look look darker. Um, it, it acts to darken your skin. And no, I, I don't know of um, any association between spray tanning and cancer, but our messages really try and get at the fact that uh, embracing your natural skin color 
um, is what we all should be striving for. So if you were born a certain skin color, kind of accepting that and being confident with your natural skin color um, is the best approach. Um, and we do that for two reasons. We believe that it's really important for building confidence in young women, but also we want to make sure that our message is applicable to people of all uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds, and we found that message really resonates. And so we're not recommending spray tans, although there's no data that they cause cancer. Regarding obesity and cancer risk, what if the relationship is not causal? What if the cause of obesity, hormone imbalance, gut bacteria, is causing the obesity and the cancer risk? Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's a phenomenal question, and I love it. And I think there are people certainly working on it. And I, you know, there, the idea behind this stems from the idea, there's this interest in, you know, that, you know, not all people that are overweight or obese are, you know, overeating or inactive. You know, there's certainly huge, you know, heritable components. Uh, there's a huge interest in, you know, the, the gut microbiome. And there's been studies showing that you can take, you know, it, microbes from the intestines and the stomach of a skin, a fat rat and put it into a skinny rat and make that rat fat and vice versa. Um, and so, yes, there's absolutely, uh, you know, a possibility that it is not causal. Um, however, in terms of increasing risk of breast cancer, those postmenopausal women, it's interesting that it seems that weight gain from the time that you um, being, you know, from the time you have menarche to the time that you become postmenopausal, um, that that is what matters. So women who start out, you know, sort of chunky or overweight, you know, at the time of, of menarche or in their teen years, um, and then stay heavy their whole life, don't seem to have as much um, of an increase in risk of postmenopausal breast cancer as women who gain a substantial amount of weight um, from their teens into their their postmenopausal years so it, it, you know of course again that could be that it's some type of gut microbiome thing that's causing that weight gain over those years um, and again in terms of the mechanisms I mean we we're digging into the mechanisms of how you know being overweight and obese can play into it and there are so many ways that as I said and I explained in my talk that um, that that adipose tissue is active um, that it's it's pretty plausible you know that 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 excess fat is is probably causing you know at least in part some of the the increased risk of cancer um, certainly could be something in your gut microbiome that also could be increasing inflammatory markers markers in your body and impacting your leptins and all those things. So um, stay tuned. It's a fantastic question. And I'm hoping that more research goes into that because I do, um, you know, coming from a family of, of overweight and obese people, I know that my sisters, both of them don't overeat. Um, and when people see a picture of me next to my sisters, they're sort of shocked. Um, and I am very sympathetic that I don't think that everyone who's overweight or obese should be judged because of it, because it is a, a largely heritable. Okay, I'm going to combine the next two questions um, for Dr. Hyatt. Are there any plans to expand SFCAN's focus to other cancers, specifically pediatric? And also, uh, we live in Marin. Can SFCAN be exported to Marin? <laughs> Well, uh, this is this is a, a, a two great two great questions because um, it gives me a chance to say SF Can is focused on San Francisco, but the cancer center is not focused only on San Francisco. The cancer center looks at uh, where our patients come from, uh, and they come from all over Northern California. If we look where where our patients live, they they live in the 48 counties sort of north of San Luis Obispo. And so we know more about the cancer burden in all of Northern California uh, than, um, uh, than just San Francisco. So we have lots of programs and lots of uh, activities that focus on other areas. Uh, Marin County. Uh, Marin County's been uh, uh, a focus of attention for a long time because of the high breast cancer rates. Um, uh, I've spent the last 12 years doing studies of uh, the environmental, potential environmental factors that, that could relate to 
uh, breast cancer incidents in, in Marin County. That's just an example of the kind of work that we do. So SF can, yes, that does focus on San Francisco. We're trying to see if something this complex can be tackled and, and met in a successful way. If it can, then we would like to export it to the other Bay Area counties, Marin, Alameda, Contra Costa, San Mateo. Um, we think we can do that if we can show that it's effective uh, in, in San Francisco. Uh, and then uh, I can tell you that we're also talking about it a lot nationally in a lot of other cancer centers around the country who are focused on what they do for their service populations or taking notice. And we think it can be exported in that sense by setting an example. So uh, I think it has legs. Uh, it's an attractive, uh, uh, sort of compelling way to approach cancer prevention in a more systematic way. Oh, and other cancers. Well, uh, yes. So uh, again, I would say we don't focus just on these five cancers. We're working uh, very much in the area of pediatric cancers and aware of the burden that, that uh, all cancers place on, on the population. Uh, but again, we are focused on these five cancers and maybe a couple of other ones. Uh, melanoma, for instance, Selene is uh, convincing us that we should be looking at that more closely. But these are the ones that are causing the most death. And, and if we want to focus our attention on the ones that are making the biggest impact, we think this is the, the way to go. Um, we're looking for help to do this. We're, we're using the resources of the, of the community and the expertise of a lot of our colleagues. Um, we, we invite you to, to help us with this. Thank you very much. For Eleni Linos, uh, regarding using Facebook in your study, do these young women actively use Facebook? My experience is they're using Snapchat, uh, yes, Instagram, and other social media, but not very active on Facebook. You're absolutely right. Um, and even though I used Facebook as the example, um, we're absolutely uh, looking at what social media platforms are being used by young women in our target audience. In fact, the launch of the first experiment will happen on Instagram because uh, Insta, I wish I knew who asked the question so I could speak directly to you, but Instagram is, Instagram is absolutely relevant uh, to this population. The reason we're doing Facebook and Instagram to start is because they allow us to actually randomize and to actually test the effectiveness of these uh, messages in a rigorous way. So the fact that we can run a randomized trial um, and test the effectiveness of a message is unique. And it's currently only available on those platforms. Once we show that these messages are effective and find out which ones are most effective, absolutely we plan to disseminate those findings using all uh, common platforms. So thanks for asking that. Okay, I'm going to combine uh, two questions regarding the wisdom study. Um, one inquiry on becoming part of the wisdom study um, on behalf of a 41-year-old year daughter, and a second, um, I'm a 46-year-old uh, Latina with dense breasts. How do I enroll in wisdom? So there's, um, if you go to the Athena Breast Health Network website, so if you just Google um, Athena Breast Health Network and then wisdom or wisdom study, you can see it. And there's actually a very nice video um, with Laura Esserman um, on it. And Amy, are you in the video too? I think, no, no, yeah, video, but you're a big part of it. Yeah, so Amy's very involved in wisdom because as I said, once a patient gets sort of stratified and if they're in the personalized breast screening and if they're found to be above a certain threshold of risk, they are referred to our, our cancer risk program. Um, so again, one of the things, the caveats of this right now is that if a patient, for example, is randomized to the personalized breast screening and that involves MRI, for example, you know, there's still a lot of controversy about what insurance companies will pay for in terms of breast MRI. And so there are, there's actually quite a big battle going on. Um, you know, Laura will never step down from any battle, um, Laura Esterman, that is. And so she's working with various insurers to support the wisdom trials. So it is a possibility, I just have to be honest, that if the insurer is not sort of signed on 
to the procedures involved with wisdom. Um, there may you may have to postpone, but Laura is actively Laura and others are actively working um, with the insurance and payers um, because the way the trial works is that the payers have to agree to sort of subscribe to whatever screening is. Um, there's just not enough money in the grant to pay for you know uh, 20 years of MRIs. And a follow-up um, for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, regarding obesity and other cancers besides breast cancer, do you know the relationships? Sure. Um, so I actually, on I think it was the first or second slide that I that I presented um, that included the you know the evidence from this working group as part of the World Health Organization that there's an association of being overweight or obese with 13 different cancers where the evidence is considered very strong and some of those cancers that I listed of course were uterine cancer liver cancer um, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus multiple myeloma gallbladder cancer pancreatic cancer colon cancer uh, meningioma, which is a benign brain tumor, thyroid cancer, and I might be forgetting one or two others, but um, yes, there's broad associations with many different types of cancers. Okay, and our final question, right on time, is how can communi community organizers and survivors concerned with less common cancers, for example, uterine, ovary, cervical, learn from or engage with SFKEN? Um, talk to me. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, I, I can tell people are feeling like their favorite cancer is not being uh, um, uh, addressed by this particular initiative. And um, let, me, let me say again that the Cancer Center's uh, broad scope of, uh, of activities covers all cancers. So if you've got questions about um, things that we can do in your community, um, that relate to less common cancers, uh, talk to me personally and I, and I can get you connected to the right kind of uh, activity. Um, SFCAN is a, is a particular thing where we're trying to show that we can make a, an impact on the population level of cancer. We would like to be able to do something like saying a county, the city and county of San Francisco, which is the heart of our catchment area, so to speak, uh, can be the healthiest uh, county in, San, in, in California in terms of cancer. So we've got a goal and the things that we think we can do are making the biggest impact on the most common cancers with things that we know work. And in order to do that, we've got to think about upstream factors like Tomas has explained and also the organization of how we care for people and how we prevent. It's a very complex, very um, um, bold way of approaching cancer and we want to show that we can do it first with the most common cancers in a defined area. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the cancer center is only looking at, at these, that these limited cancers. Thank you very much. <laughs>